Good morning. And I want to thank everybody for coming to this conference uh, that explores the intersection of public journalism, deliberative democracy, and narrative. Um, my name is Sarah Cobb, and I am the director of the Center for the Study of Narrative and Conflict Resolution. And um, we are uh, here together at uh, George Mason University. Um, and the center is itself part of the School for Conflict Analysis and Res Resolution. So I'll tell you a little bit about um, the center and the school, and then um, hand the mic over to my colleague, uh, George Dwyer, who's a research scholar at the center as well. And he, all of this conference is his fault. Uh, he's helped bring the issue forward of public journalism and deliberative democracy. So um, I'm going to. Uh, turn the com turn the mic over to him for the comments. Um, I wanted to give you a note that we're live streaming um, on Facebook, so very happy to have uh, the people in the room and the people welcome everybody who's not with us uh, and with us virtually. Delighted to have your participation. Um, uh, the Narrative Center is uh, designed. Its its purpose is to function as a hub for questions, research questions, and the development of theory at the intersection of narrative and conflict resolution. So you can imagine narrative is implicated not only in the production of conflict, but in its evolution or transformation as well. So we've got research projects that are exploring both the production, both those two things, both the production of conflict and its, and its evolution. Um, so I wanted to end this moment at, before moving forward to discussing the school. Um, stop and thank Sarah Spencer. Where is she? There she is. Uh, Sarah is, should be part of the live streaming on Facebook. Um, Sarah is uh, a graduate student at our program at the School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. She's the managing director of the center, and she put this conference on. So I'm really, really grateful. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, she did everything organizing this, so I'm really grateful to her. Um, I also want to acknowledge the um, dean of our program, Kevin Avrook, who's with us here today. He's the dean for the School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. And um, I, I don't believe he's going to be able to stay the whole day because he's, he's got deanly duties. But um, I'm really delighted to have him here as well. Now, the school is a, um, we have a master's, a PhD, and a undergraduate program and a set of certificates. We've been around since 1982. We are the oldest. We are the biggest, and we are the best program in conflict resolution, uh, we think, in the world today. Um, and uh, our, our interest is on um, interdisciplinary approaches to conflict, so you can see why narrative is a natural, uh, let's see, has a natural home for an interdisciplinary study of conflict resolution. Um, so before getting in, I don't want to get into the meat of the conference, I would just like to um, introduce George who's had George Dwyer here, who's um, to blame, as I said, for this fabulous opportunity today uh, being with you. He's going to describe the purpose of why we're here. He's, a, as I said, a research scholar at the center and, um, I don't know, 22 years in journalism, um, a more recent PhD, and at the intersection of public journalism and deliberative democracy. So. Um, I'm, we're really delighted to have him participating at the center and very pleased to have him suggest this idea of the conference today and look forward to what we're going to learn together. George. Yeah. Good morning. At public journalism, the focus of our first panel this morning, represents a wide range of collaborative journalism practices and experiments. This morning we will hear about its origins, its trajectory, and about what it may offer to the field of conflict communication. We're pleased to welcome a panel of scholars with deep practical knowledge about the historic project of public journalism. I'll introduce them in just a minute, but first let me begin by describing the rest of our day. <clears throat> Uh, following our first panel, we'll break at 10.15 uh, for refreshments in the back of the room and a stretch. Uh, 
At 10.30, we'll start up again with our second panel on deliberative democracy. And then just before noon, we'll break and move to the other side of the room for our lunch. Uh, once we're seated, Dr. Carolyn Lukensmeyer, Dr. Carolyn, Carolyn Lukensmeyer, Executive Director of the National Institute for Civil Discourse, will deliver a short address. Dr. Lukensmeyer is a longtime leader in the fields of deliberative democracy and an entertaining speaker. I know this. Uh, this afternoon, after our lunch, we will convene a World Cafe. This is an informal gathering designed for sharing thoughts about our discussions this morning. And we'll have more to share on that following lunch. Uh, now getting back to the business of this morning. There's a common thread linking public journalism, deli deliberative democracy, and civil discourse. And we believe that conflict scholars can learn from these related projects. And so today, with the help of these scholars, we will try to understand the scope and promise of these two important social movements. But we also want to hear about any false hopes and blind alleys as we consider how lessons learned from public journalism and deliberative democracy can be incorporated into our own practice. And so we begin our morning panel on public journalism. Joining us from the University of Maryland's Merrill School of Journalism is Professor Linda Steiner. Dr. Steiner has written about the origins of public journal journalism and has tracked has tracked its course over the past couple of decades. <clears throat> also with us as a featured speaker is Dr. Margo Seska of American University, American University School of Communication. Professor Seska runs the master's program in journalism and digital storytelling. Uh, joining our panel as discussants are Dr. Arthur Romano from the School of Conflict Analysis and Resolution, and unfortunately, we have uh, to announce that Dr. Mohammed Sharkawi will not be able to join us today, so I'll be sitting in as well. Dr. Steiner, you begin. Thank you, and thank you, George. Um, I'm very honored to be here, and uh, I don't blame you. I, I thank you for uh, putting this Together. So I've been tasked with uh, setting out some historical context, and I'll give a little philosophical context as well. Let me begin just by saying that the controversy over public journalism racked both practitioners in journalism and journalism scholars in the 1990s when it was urged to enrich democracy by narrowing the widening gap between citizens and political figures, and also citizens and news media. Now, to say rack seems a little quaint these days. Um, we have bigger fish to fry, I think. But in any case, at the time, declines in voter participation in elections and in local public affairs was taken as evidence that citizens were disengaged with politics and were cynical and therefore sort of withdrawing from political processes, and that this disaffection and the cynicism was at least partly to be blamed on journalists whose um, obsession, let's say, with horse race coverage of campaigns um, and ignoring the bigger issues uh, seemed banal. Um, so the idea was that news organizations should actually actively take a role in enhancing civic commitment and participation. And they would do so by listening to citizens, learning their interests, figuring out what people were really concerned about, and then taking that seriously in their the 1990s brainchild, I would say, of NYU professor Jay Rosen and his good friend Davis Merritt, the editor of the Wichita Eagle. Um, they drew primarily on Habermas's 
uh, notion of the public sphere. And uh, so they drew on uh, literatures about journalism as actually having a role in enriching the public sphere. So uh, again, at the heart of public journalism was listening to citizens and not merely uh, pundits, experts, elites, um, and certainly not political consultants. Public journalism projects would show citizens trying to solve the problem that they had decided needed to be solved. And thus, uh, public journalists address citizens as members of the deliberative public. By 1998, more than 60% of US daily newspapers had experimented at least once in some form with public journalism. Um, this took the form of individual projects working across platforms, sometimes uh, with civic organizations. Um, again, trying to hear what was relevant to uh, citizens, especially marginalized groups, and then embarking on serious projects sometimes that were otherwise commercially unpopular and maybe even off-putting. So that included racial profiling and racism, poverty, homelessness, substance abuse, domestic violence, and so forth. Um, nearly half of the public journalism projects that uh, were launched in that period involved some kind of public uh, discussion, focus groups, round tables, town halls. Um, so stakeholders were involved at that level, and sometimes various stakeholders also um, addressed one another and even wrote columns or op-eds, kind of article that got published. But mainly public journalism stories themselves were written by and researched by journalists, professional journalists. It was criticized on a number of grounds. Some people said it was simply good journalism anyway, and it wasn't really significant from conventional journalism. Others worried that it was historically naive, maybe just a cynical marketing strategy. Um, some people argued that it would compromise professional journalists uh, standing as disin disinterested um, professionals. Public journalism was accused of pushing consensus and ignoring differences across social groups. Um, professionals were criticized for crossing the line from neutral reporting into political advocacy. And there were some conceptual flaws as well. On one hand, and some of these arguments, as you see, are contradictory. On one hand, its kind of communitarian philosophy was criticized for underestimating the problem of conflicting versions of the public good. And ironically, its liberal democratic approach to individuals as individuals was uh, criticized for ignoring um, how people might act out of self-interest um, and not be so interested in um, joint deliberation and communal action. In any case, I would say the movement lasted about 20 years. Um, Jay Rosen himself essentially abandoned the concept, first morphing into from public journalism to a public's uh, apostrophe S journalism, and then ultimately into citizen journalism. And as we know, citizen journalism not only rejects the authority of professionals, um, but very often bypasses professional journalism altogether. But certainly public journalism raised some important questions. That is, in what ways can journalism help vivify or revivify democracy? 
what does the movement or its death and the success of its uh, subsequent projects say about people as political beings um, with political interests and relationships? Um, certainly, one thing we know is that the kind of intellectual and cognitive as well as affective distance between citizens and journalism remains. So uh, now let me just kind of sum up the, the, the assessment. Um, certainly, we should credit public journalism for reconceptualizing audiences as citizens, not consumers. Um, and it did have some impact on political activity. So some research, albeit fragmentary and small scale, showed that news organizations practicing public journalism produced greater amounts of election-related reporting, and it was more substantive, and um, as promised use, more non-elite sources, including women and minorities, although not as um, and those features did increase interest and discussion of issues. It certainly increased actual voting and seemed to increase inclination to contact public officials with questions um, and to participate in problem solving activities. In terms of its conceptual legacy, um, certainly. Um, one of the points I'd like to make is that although public journalism did preserve kind of special role for journalists, meaning professional journalists, um, it did privilege a notion of citizens as both rational and as um, and political, as active. Um, so. Uh, notably, um, one of the commissions that issued a, a report on what it called the information needs of communities in democracy said that um, in a healthy democratic community, all people have convenient, affordable access to an abundant range of information in journalism, actively share knowledge, um, enjoy digital and media literacy, understand the role of free speech. These things were all at the heart of public journalism. Um, and I would also make the point that at a certain level, public journalism ought to be credited for going beyond an information model or at least a strictly information model of journalism. The problem may be that um, in or to the extent that it retained a notion of journalism as providing information, it probably overestimated the issue of rationality and information and fact and underestimated affect and people's interest in communicating, being the communicators uh, regardless of uh, its actuality, and clearly this um, critique has some major implications for the theme of uh, today, although it's not my job to um, this positive. I'm just raising, just raising the issue about the difference between journalism and communication as information for rational purposes and as affective for the sake of communication. Um, but beyond that, public journalism ought to be credited for practicing journalism in ways that were very consistent with democratic values as well as journalism values um, for um, having an interest in providing opportunities for people to actually physically as well as um, cognitively engage with 
other citizens in public deliberation. And that's not unimportant. Again, these days, I would just note that the complaints are not necessarily disengagement and apathy or cynicism, but rather extremism and partisanship. Um, and finally, I think maybe public journalism's greatest legacy was uh, the importance of listening. So its commitment to doing listening and to partnering with professionals who sometimes take a back to citizens is itself quite an innovation. Um, and it required journalists uh, also to depart from kind of the typical episodic reporting um, and to engage with a political group outside the elites um, and to do a kind of slower, more um, elaborate, long form form of narrative. Um, I would say in the end that there is a kind of tension between participation and openness and experimentation, flexibility on one hand, and gatekeeping and editing and concern for uh, factuality on the other hand. Perhaps it's the case that not one solution is ever going to work for all of these problems. Maybe it's time to revisit Chairman Mao's uh, famous uh, policy of letting a hundred flowers bloom and a hundred schools of thought. Thank you very much. Did you, uh, we'll go to you next. Oh, oh, well, then we'll just start a discussion, okay. yeah. Oh, no. Well, uh, Linda, no, that's all right. Uh, Linda, in giving her remarks about listening, and I know that you work with younger students. Are they, is this a, a value that they bring? So I have the, the pleasure at American University of working with both undergraduate and graduate students. And I think that what I see coming in, especially when I teach first year students, is a misunderstanding of what the role of journalism is in American democracy. And so I, I always tell people in my work with journalism and democracy, and um, when I grow up, I think I'm going to work just on media literacy. And I think that it starts, you know, by the time they get to me, by the time they get to you, as you know, whether they're 18 or 25, I almost think sometimes it's too late. The media literacy has to start as, as young as elementary school, which, but that's also an understanding not just of journalism, but of basic civics and social studies. And as a former education reporter, what I can say I think a, a big concern for me is that the rise of standardized testing and this overemphasis on, you know, drilling students on, you know, these core reading and math skills means that there is a loss of social studies and civics education in, in schools the way when I was in school growing up in Connecticut there, there was. Um, and I think that that's dangerous, right? That that's, there's a problem when an 18-year-old gets to a college that costs $65,000 a year and doesn't understand the role of journalism and democracy. So I often am asked when I do interviews or speak, you know, how can journalism help? How can journalism help? And I say, you know, this isn't a problem just of journalism. You know, we can't take this on ourselves. I mean, there's much that we can do. Um, and, you know, I have some thoughts based on what Linda said, but we can't do it alone. You, you know, this is, this is, everyone needs to work on this. Um, so, I, you know, I think if that answers your question, I'm hopeful by the end of the semester, they generally care more, which is good. Um, but I think that there needs to be a re-engagement with, with civics and with an understanding of, of politics, with an understanding of media and the role of politics in society. Arthur, do you have anything to offer? Um, well, I can. I just can offer some some reflections um, on uh, Dr. Steiner's presentation. Which, thank you for that. It was it was helpful to have a, a succinct uh, overview of twenty years of, of public journalism. Uh, and then and ending um, with some real questions for us to think about. 
both in terms of, of thinking about how we um, narrow the gap between cit cit you know, citizens and political processes, which has been uh, a challenge uh, increasingly. I think we're in an interesting time with that where we have uh, models of political leadership that especially are emphasizing a form of strength, a, a kind of masculine leadership that doesn't apologize, uh, knows, has a sense of expertise about issues as they arise, and connects with people uh, in, in ways that, are, that have a lot of affect, but don't necessarily create the kinds of spaces that you highlighted uh, in terms of, of a deliberative sense. Uh, so that I think that we're in a particularly interesting moment in terms of thinking about how power operates and the ways that people um, can be involved in politics. One can feel involved in politics through a variety of medium and uh, process. <laughs> All right, thank you. Is it going back there? I think that sounds better. OK. Um, so also, uh, one of the things that came to mind in, 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 in both of these initial comments, too, were these deep structural differences that we have in the US today, right? So we're at a point where we have deep racial segregation. So our schools are as segregated as they were in, in, in 1968. I think it's happening. OK. Can you hear me now? Did we get it? OK, so, so we're in a moment of deep um, structural separation in many ways, right? So we have uh, s racial segregation, schools as segregated as they were in the late 60s. Uh, we have deep economic uh, segregation, so our communities and where we actually live. From a conflict resolution perspective, this raises issues about the dynamics of contact across lines of difference. So, so when we are hearing about public journalism, an attempt to go and, and have conversations about civic issues with people in the life worlds where they make meaning about those issues, uh, in part to, to bring that into a more robust conversation in the public sphere requires some ability to connect across those lines of difference, to see and understand the life world of those people and what is happening on a daily level in the struggles and political issues that they're dealing with. Uh, and so, so that is, I think, a challenge because it, in some ways, in, and this is emphasized with, uh, I was thinking about reality TV. Reality TV can go into some of these spaces. I think about the kind of fetishization of poverty and race in the US. Uh, shows like Honey Boo Boo come to mind, the, the programs in which they interview people in jails. These are not to be taken lightly. People, there's a lot, they have a, a large followership. And so those spaces and problems that people are dealing with are, are presented in a way in which they're caricatured for people to have a sort of um, ability to kind of distance themselves from and feel better as a result of seeing what those people are struggling with. So I, I think there's a, this is an interesting moment to see, for me, as someone kind of looking from the outside in and not in journalism, about the, what possibilities does that create for us to sort of be able to connect with people around the problems that they're dealing with in the, and, and in some ways try to understand more deeply uh, the way that they're making meaning and what that means for their daily life. Because we can, we can sort of watch it from a distance, but actually that can sometimes uh, further uh, kind of overemphasize the gap. Uh, so, so I think interesting questions there about the possibilities for bringing people together across political lines of difference and other economic and racial lines of difference, how in a society in which there's less contact, uh, real-time contact uh, across those lines, what are the possibilities for creating robust civic conversations? Um, and how do we, and what is the role of journalism potentially in, in looking at uh, how people might come together to address those structural challenges as well? which really bumps up against this, um, this line that, uh, that Dr. Steiner pointed out, where at least from the journalism point of view, I think people are up against an edge around, are you, being, are you a journalist? Are you an advocate? How far can you go to, to address these uh, structural issues that in some ways are limiting not only what you can do in terms of reporting, but how you can reach people in terms of their um, 
the ways in which they can make meaning from the experiences that are being presented to them. So, so in this time, I think we're, we're facing uh, those differences quite, uh, quite starkly. So I can tell you <coughs> that the uh, public journalism, uh, as Linda mentioned, uh, really launched in the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, around the early after 2001, uh, had a slight resurgence. And there's a gentleman named Dan Gilmore, a, a journalist who wrote a book called We the Media. And did incorporate all of these ideas of citizens and, and journalists working together in collaborative journalism as more of a that and so now the notion that the youth classroom or journalism as so I wanna if I may address this point of structure. I, I'm a political economist, I guess I should say that, like full disclosure, um, so which means I study the structure of media organizations, corporate media ownership, and the impact that that structure has on narrative and storytelling. So when I hear issues of structure, to me what that is is the barrier between structure and you know stories getting told or, or issues in, in society it's, it's one of bean counters, right? I mean, that's what I would say, which is the reason we aren't getting those stories, the reason we didn't get them in the run-up to the election, why we didn't understand anything about the United States between D.C. and Los Angeles. Right? It was like an entire section of the country which we just like forgot. We didn't understand what was happening in Kansas or West Virginia. Um, the reason is corporate media, mainstream media that is puts profit over public democracy, right? what happens is, they won't pay for good journalism, right? That's the issue, right? When you have shareholders that expect, you know, a profit margin twice as much as you would get from, you know, when you're sen selling any other widget, I think that that's a big issue. So I think this role of the collaboration between citizen and journalist, maybe that is a new model that can, you know, kind of buck the system. And I think when we talk about the system, which is not working, and which started public journalism, to me, when we talk about the late, you know, 1980s and the early 1990s, really that what happened is that was a time of great media consolidation, right? Ben Bagdikian, who was writing in the 19, early 1980s about 50 companies owning um, all, you know, 90% of American media. Today that number is six, right? And what that happened was after the 1980s, a huge period of deregulation, a huge period where shareholders started wanting more profit. You got greater coverage of entertainment and celebrities. So after 9-11, certainly there was this spike, right, this rise of like, whoa, what's, what's happening in the world, right? But I still think today when, and, and now you're talking about a merger potentially between Disney and 21st Century Fox, which is going to shrink that number even further. So when I, you know, in, in my work, when I look at journalism and democracy and storytelling, I look at structure first. And I say, okay, maybe we should, you know, figure out Let's set aside these five or six companies that are telling really skewed versions of American stories. And you mentioned reality television is one, and I think news is another. And we have to look at ways where we can get out into an audience and really tell stories about people. I think what happens is, what I tell my students, is that we have to be prepared to tell it to an audience that's much, much smaller. Right? No longer are we in a world where Dan Rather is reaching everyone at you know 6.30 at night, every night. I still can't call my mother between 6.30 and 7. She won't answer the telephone because she's still watching the CBS Evening News. That's not my students. So I think you, know, you look at great work that's being done, nonprofit models of journalism, right? The Marshall Project is the first that comes to my mind, which has started as a, you know, an intense investigative look at the criminal justice system. So I tell my students, like, Let's think about stories we can tell there. Let's look at ProPublica. Um, you know, we, I still read the New York Times every day. Still, I still read the New York Daily News every day too, but um, those aren't the only sources of information. And I don't think that mainstream media is doing enough to get into places to tell stories of people outside of urban centers in, in the United States. And I think that that's a, that's a great threat. That's a great issue. And the reason they're not doing it isn't because of we don't have trained people. The reason they're not doing it is because it, quite frankly, is too expensive. It's too expensive to justify to shareholders. And I think that's, you know, that's a big problem. So I don't know if that answers your question. But everyone, 
you know, I, th I think it's important that you understand my perspective, which is, you know, as a person who studies structure, um, to me that's the most important issue that we have in the United States today is media consolidation and corporate media ownership. Yeah, this brings to mind a question, and, and it draws from some work that I've done recently in St. Louis and Ferguson where we were um, working with people who had lost loved ones to police violence. And so that was both in the area in and around Ferguson and St. Louis, and then also that people people who came nationally who had that experience, some of them well-known, like Sandra Bland's sister or Michael Brown's father, and many who were not. And so in those in the process of collecting those stories and bringing together activists and advocates to talk with folks who had had that experience, um, in those conversations, people came to a place in which they, they wanted more people to know, so, so people who had lost loved ones to police violence wanted more people to know about the impacts of that on their families and communities, as well as it, when that is also joined with mass incarceration. So, some filmmakers came in and some videos were produced and we wrote some curriculum and, and attempted to share it. And so in hearing both this move towards citizen journalism as well as this, um, you're, you're telling folks that they need to be ready to, to reach smaller audiences. I think the question I wanna ask is, um, is just how do you understand uh, these attempts to kind of surface stories that, are, that may be telling a counter narrative that's quite different than what corporate media is telling is is kind of how they're framing the, the issues, um, even across the political spectrum, and it, you know just uh, and what what's your thinking about how the power relations between those and the and even just on a on a more grounded level the creative possibilities there right uh, if it was a if a hundred flowers uh, let a hundred flowers uh, bloom we're talking about letting millions of flowers bloom potentially in this case. Um, and of course, you know, I, I, I want to continue with this metaphor about, you know, whether who's if it's if there's the, um, somebody has a big plow that can just plow over the field, or whether they're going to be watered, or whatever the case may be. But certainly, these power dynamics between, you know, kind of, between diffuse, right, smaller scale storytelling, the there's some possibilities there for networks. I, I'm not I'm not in the world, seeing it from the journalism side. I'm seeing it more from the connecting with community side and just interested about what you see in terms of possibilities. Um, let me first, I don't know if I'm being heard. You seem to know in the back, thank you. Um, a, a, just a semantic um, point here. So I'm distinguishing public journalism, although certainly, and Dan may talk about this later. There were a, a range of ways of doing public journalism from ones that were very much controlled by public journalists, professional journalists, to ones that were in partnership. But generally, the bulk of public journalism was done by professionals. So I'm distinguishing that from Dan Gilmore and successors' notions of citizen journalism. Maybe we could bring both of these schools of thought into um, one big tent by calling it civic journalism, but that term really didn't catch on a lot, maybe because it wasn't clear what it was. Um, so now to answer your really very um, important question, I think that whether we like it or not, there are going to be these various citizen projects. And there are going to be those millions of people who are trying to tell their own stories in the ways that they think are important and that they believe they can do better than professional journalists, either because they don't see professionals there at all or because they've lost their jobs because of um, these massive economic crises, um, or because they don't uh, trust them. Um, so that, um, that plow has already gone through <laughs> and, um, and made space for all of these uh, projects. Um, whether 
whether that's good, I mean, what we're going to see is a lot of really wonderful projects like the ones that you're talking about, um, where people are really earnestly, sincerely trying to tell their stories in ways that they find meaningful and they're really trying to communicate the truth, big T, to other people. We're going to see a lot of horrible stuff in that sense, too. And the, the point I was trying to make about professional journalism is even to the extent that it departed from conventional journalism by having these kinds of collaborations and by listening more carefully in a more sustained way, um, it, it did produce a kind of journalism that was still professional and in some sense almost uh, reliable for good and for bad. The citizen projects uh, go from one extreme to the other politically um, uh, in terms of rationality and in terms of motive. Um, so the question is, can democracy um, withstand that enormous range? I mean, again, it doesn't really matter if we say it can't because it's there for good and for bad. Um, but it, it's going to have that huge, huge variability um, in terms of the citizen-run project. And um, all of it leaving out professionals. So I think there, this is where, we, when we talk about stories, this is, I think, the importance of story that can kind of um, allay that cognitive dissonance. You've heard one storyline, one narrative that's been presented every night by CNN or CBS or the New York Times, and then what you have is a group of people who go into a community, and then they seem to tell a story that is different, right? This is you know, a different kind of story, and I think that this is where... Um, you know, these, these shorter stories using visuals, I think, can be very effective. And I think about StoryCorps, um, for those of you who are fans, um, I lived in New York City on 9-11. I was a graduate student at Columbia University. I covered 9-11. Um, you know, I, I read the anniversary stories every year. And this past year, they had a StoryCorps had a piece, two and a half minutes long, and it was filtered through the, the eyes of a, of a gentleman from New York, kind of a typical Italian New Yorker like my dad, who lost his, uh, lost his wife on 9-11. And it was, again, two and a half minutes long, and it was just a story about their love. And I was crying at the end of listening to that. Now, I'm a per I mean, I, I covered it. I, I read you know, New York media every single day. And here is a new presentation of information, two and a half minutes long, just audio, that had me looking at the issue in a completely new way. So I think when we you know, hear about these you know, filmmakers in Ferguson or you know, advocates in other places getting a story out, I think that these are real opportunities. We have to see it as an opportunity to change the narrative or at least to enhance it in some way. And I think this idea that we have to change people's minds you know, maybe is, is not the right perspective, but I certainly hope that we can ask them to consider a new perspective that they haven't thought of to consider that through the eyes of a person who hasn't worked you know, for a few years or who hasn't you know, done you know, whatever that issue is, has someone in prison. Or, and so I think we have to embrace these and you know, as, as new ways of looking at an issue from multiple, multiple perspectives. So it doesn't always have to be you know, a 5,000 word front page New York Times story. And you open up the page and ah, there's all these words, right? I mean, I think that this is what it, it can be. It's, it's, it can be small audio or small video. Um, and I think that it's stories, right? And it's this, this point of affect, which I think is, you know, what's missing from this, you know, current media landscape of talking head, talking head, yelling back and forth at each other is really, you know, how people are being affected, how people are still being affected. And I'm encouraged to see even Parkland, what's happening in the wake of, um, the shooting in South Florida, how these young people have just taken control of social media and they have bucked a narrative that has been brought to us by a public interest group, a very powerful lobby, and they are going head to head with, with the NRA and head to head with politicians that take money from the NRA. 
And they are doing it in a way that mainstream media has not been able to do in years. And I, so when I look at that every, every day, I'm so encouraged um, by those young people and, and what, they're, you know, what they're doing, the story that they're trying to tell. Um, and, and look at the effect that it's having. And I think that's really incredible. Linda and I had a discussion. I don't think we ever included. Uh, <clears throat> I was asking if the hashtag Me Too could be looked at as an example of stories surface being taken up in mainstream. I think uh, that is um, plausible. Certainly, it has, um, I don't know, bubbling up, flooded out in a yeah. tsunami of uh, stories and, and has um, been taken up by um, larger kind of legacy news organizations. Um, I mean, the fact is, is that it's also been addressed uh, by all kinds of niche uh, news sites online and uh, tweets. Uh, so in that sense, I, again, I think you're right. News, legacy news organizations have covered it. But even if they hadn't, it, it's getting so much attention. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure it's a, it's a great case for public journalism. Um, and one of the things that interests me, too, is how now what we're getting, not only in legacy media, but again, in, in the niche sites, in, in the citizen news sites, are all kinds of discussions about um, the Whisper Network. So it turns out all kinds of people knew about, and now I'm just talking about men who were harassing journalists in newsrooms or in bars near newsrooms. Um, so I'm not talking about the Hollywood stuff, but the, but the issues within journalism that all kinds of women um, were not only discussing it with one another, had seen it. There were m men uh, in the newsroom who had seen women being harassed and nothing got said. So um, yeah, now now the dam has burst. Um, but I, I guess I'm not much crediting legacy journalism, and so I don't much see this as a public journalism project, um, but as a as a citizen project. That's my, I mean, I, I think it, I have investigative journalism in in my blood, and I think that. Me Too never would have started had the New York Times not had two women who reported that story on Harvey Weinstein, and then you had Ronan Farrow who did a story a few days later in The New Yorker. So I think journalism, investigative journalism still matters. Me Too and Time's Up, these wouldn't have been in existence had it not been for those investigative stories about Weinstein. Now, should they have come years earlier? Certainly sounds like there were murmurings um, but they did, and I think that movement um, was spawned by good investigative journalism, and I think that that's important to note. Yeah, I, I point taken. Yeah. I think that's a really important point, and I absolutely um, want to credit the New Yorker and the New York Times for, for doing it. Um, uh, I mean, it does also show what it took they were working on it so long. Pharaoh had um, taken um, the story to his network, and they passed on it. So, um, but but yes, yeah. you're right. Ultimately, we do have to credit those organizations, and and I agree that it it wouldn't have happened um, without the strength of those two organizations willing to put resources for a long time into it. That so we're going to take some questions from the audience, but one last question from the panel. Arthur, I wanted to ask you, as the conflict scholar on the panel, uh, listening to this, 
Do you, are there any takeaways that you see for conflict communications? I hedged a little bit in that direction in, in my earlier comments. I'm thinking about how do we deal with some of these larger, for lack of a, of a more nuanced way to say it, structural conflicts, uh, and how do we bring people together across lines of difference in those conversational moments in ways that um, they can really access their different experiences and that others from broader audiences can um, can potentially get that in the in the media context. I mean, just in listening to these to the to these last few comments, um, you know, the the connection with social movements and journalism in this thousand flowers growing context. We see Parkland. If we think about Ferguson and, and the example I gave of the Truth Telling Project, we're seeing media production and engagement with media joining with social movement work. That means bodies in the street and political organizing organizations and those and those kinds of dynamics. So, um, so you have this piece that we like, I think, in conflict resolution, which is that we come together in a communicative moment and we get each other. And then this other part, which is often quite difficult, which is as how do we find collective efficacy to influence these kinds of issues that are pretty uh, durable and difficult to shift over time, which is part of what, what kind of got, got me most excited about public journalism, was this idea in, in, in what you were talking about, um, uh, Linda, about this um, idea that people had a, a had greater sense of agency in terms of problem solving and institutions and the, and, the, and the desire to engage with institutions. I think that's a little bit harder to see in all that we're talking about here. So I, I'm, I'm sitting here, my conflict scholar, I'm gonna give you something that's, you know, of course, not for, very well formed, right? And, and hopefully that um, some of the, I'll, I'll learn from some of your comments about then if we are in a space where we have, you know, a greater texturing and diversity of story, as well as powerful social movements that we haven't seen in the US in, in, in decades, uh, then what, what are the possibilities there for, uh, for conflict resolution, for collective efficacy and political change? and for deeper end understanding at a time in which we have economic and racial segregation that's, um, that's been uh, a divide that's been growing. Uh, so that you, you've given me plenty to think about, and I'm excited to hear what, what um, folks will share in the questions. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Carlos Luzki. Uh, I'm, um, was a, while ago, uh, editor of a uh, professional journal. And our, in our board, there were other people who were not in, in professional time. And uh, whenever we would discuss things about the journal, uh, they would ask, yeah, yes, 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 but will it sell in Peoria? No? And uh, this issue of will it sell in Peoria that stayed with me is related to Part of uh, what you, you, Arthur, were saying about the, this vast uh, tearjerker programs in which they interview uh, people in jail or in whatever and uh, create or offer to people simplified stories. You know, th these are simple stories. And talking about narratives, the interesting thing of the uh, situation of the children, these kids that suddenly um, uh, took action in their hands rather than just uh, crying in each other's arms as it was a simple story. It's to make it more complex. So the, uh, the, the movement that I believe uh, uh, brings together these, these, these variables is, requires uh, presenting more complex stories. There's here the complex story is these kids not only were uh, simply crying, but they had a voice and they had a voice and they did things. This they did things was what was picked up and amplified by the media. If not, it would have been a in very interesting uh, uh, epiphenomenon of this, all these killings. So the media uh, 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 responsibility, one of the media responsibilities, is the amplification of the voice uh, of, the, uh, of the complex complexity of the stories, uh, in, in my view. And uh, so you, are, you were saying, uh, uh, Dr. Suska, the, the uh, issue of uh, 
reaching smaller audience. And uh, yeah, that is, uh, I believe, a call for an underground work. And so from that perspective, you are proposing that in order to carry on whatever remains of the possibility of the liberal democracy in public journalism would be, well, to resign ourselves to be stuck with the six, six companies that own 90 something percent of the media, and we do uh, underground work. And that's one of the fronts. The other front may be that of choose for uh, uh, facilitating the, uh, the responsible expansion or com complefi complification, making more complex stories that merit being done. That's what I think. I think when I think of the underground, I think of like Václav Havel and Prague, you know, I, so I don't, I don't think when I, when I talk about these smaller media outlets that they're necessarily underground, you know, a mimeograph machine and under, you know, in a basement or something. Um, I think that we have to be prepared to have audiences that aren't as large as they were in the glory days of journalism post Watergate. I think that's what I that's what I mean. And whether or not that's inside climate news or the Marshall Project, whether you're reaching fifty thousand really dedicated readers or viewers, I think that's a start. I also think that, you know, and I'm gonna it's gonna be on my headstone. I don't think that we just should live with these six companies. You know, you know, I think deregulation is a huge issue. And you know, I've been telling that story and it's gotten a lot of attention since um, the Disney 21st Century Fox proposed merger. But I mean, we have to look at ways that the Department of Justice should be regulating using antitrust laws against these huge media corporations. And I would love to educate, you know, I, I'll maybe put a sign out and go stand near the Clarendon Metro and try to get people to care about it. I think that what I'm saying is until we can get a change in, in media regulation, we can't just say, well, you're not going to work at CBS News. Too bad. Go work in public relations for Monsanto. What I'm saying is we still need storytellers. We still need investigative journalism. Let's figure out a way to do it, and let's keep talking about this, and let's keep educating people about the importance of good journalism and democracy. Yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. I would just add to that comment, too, um, that, that uh, public journalism, civic journalism, citizens' journalism, whatever you call it, it's seen uh, essentially as a parallel track to mainstream, established, institutional journalism. So there's no inference that this overtakes or eclipses uh, or journalism as it has been. It's supplemental. And, uh, but I believe it does, uh, it, it do, does complexify stories, uh, would tend to in a public journalism approach more than you would see in a mainstream media approach. Uh, that's my opinion. Thank you. So <clears throat> I heard two, two senses of narrative that you alluded to, Dr. Steiner. And I hope we can expand on at least those two. One is uh, the narratives that journalism or journalism and the other is public narratives about journalism. I think it's the interaction between tension between those two that characterizes the media landscape and the public landscape today. And my sense, building on what Carlos said, my sense is that the narratives that quality journalism tells are usually complex in long form. Certainly the 30,000 word New Yorker profile was always complex. Whereas the, the narratives about journalism, the public narratives about journalism have become incredibly simple. And it's the tension between those two that I think is important to consider. And let me give one example of the simpleness. Uh, narratives take many forms, many, many components, but a primordial component of a narrative is a, is a hero. And 
I've been reflecting on this. I saw the film The Post a couple weeks ago. And I was reflecting on that compared to All the President's Men. The film was, I think, 1976. Um, and boy, was that a, the, the, well, both were in more complex ways. Boy, was the President's Men a hero. I mean, Ben Bradley was mythologized. And one of the interesting things about Post in these more gendered times is finally Catherine Graham was mythologized too. Um, for those kind of a little younger than I am, after that movie, the first movie, uh, w which had two very attractive actors in it, which didn't hurt compared to the real Woodward and Bernstein, who guys, um, there was a tremendous surge in applications to journalism schools. In fact, a surge that was so tremendous that later so many of those folks, when the market shrunk, couldn't get or keep jobs. But part of that reflected a time, part of that reflected a sense of what the Washington Post did for the public in uh, exposing the Watergate scandal. Um, and you know, in some ways, the story of the Pentagon Papers is, of course, as in all great mythic cycles, the prequel, right, to um, to the Watergate scandal. Uh, Nixon being the antihero in both, which is the other powerful figure. Um, and so it got me thinking about narratives about journalism, about how they change generationally or culturally, um, and. It got me thinking about whether or not the um, I, I would assume the almost complete approbation with which the investigative journalism around the Watergate was treated by most Americans, how complicated that is today with the Pentagon and how uh, Fox News would react to Daniel Ellsberg. And whether or not, because it was still a very thin Supreme Court decision, right? Whether or not that narrative about Ellsberg as a traitor would be the one that prevailed. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure there's any co coherent question there. I do think that um, that there's a tension between the complex narratives that journalism seeks to tell and the simple public narratives about journalism today. That is an area that I hope we can look at um, uh, more closely as the day proceeds. And that, um, boy, I think there's a dissertation to be written on the difference between all the presidents. Yeah, I think you raise uh, a very important question. Um, and actually, one of the things that I would have spoken about more formally had I had more time. Um, so I'm glad I have now an opportunity to make this point, is one of, the, one of my criticisms of public journalism is that for all the um, space that it did create, literally and metaphorically, for citizens as they convene them to uh, help in the deliberation about what are the problems, public journalism as a movement, never created a space for um, citizens to hold journalists to account. Um, so we don't have, as there are in some other countries, um, uh, citizen review boards or accountability boards. A few newspapers have had uh, ombuds or they've had public editors, but that's not something that's really taken hold and and public journalists probably would have been the, um, the group to create those if they had um, if they were going to be created. So we don't have these kinds of um, systems that again, public journalism could have made space for for citizens to critique journalists. And I think it's also worth saying, and I'm not making a connection, but um, my sense is that journalists in the United States are amazingly thin-skinned. Um, they can dish it out, but they can't take it. Um, 
so um, I, I'm not sure that that was the point that you were making um, with this notion of the difference between um, the the journalist critique of issues and citizens critique of journalist coverage. Um, but I think it does account for, again, this continuing disjuncture between professional journalists and the citizens that they claim uh, to serve. And I think it's something that we really need to do something about. Solving the economic crisis, I think, is more important. Um, but I think that there would be a greater buy-in to the um, important role of journalists and journalism in democracy if citizens had a sense of journalists being more accountable to them. I think in terms of narrative, it doesn't need to be long, right? Failing New York Times, fake news. Let's look at how that has created a movement for you know, some members of the Republican and conservative party and maybe even you know, among liberals as well. So, you know, but I think, I was just saying to Jan Schaefer uh, earlier today, um, we've seen a rise in applications in our, uh, with students interested in investigative journalism and not in the same way I think that you had after um, Watergate, but I'm encouraged by that. I'm encouraged that there perhaps is a movement among some that this constant drumbeat against the media is having, for some, a flipped effect, so to speak. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's just such a fascinating time. I mean, really, we, to, be, to be studying journalism and to be in the audience, I mean, it's just, but, you know, Ellsberg, everyone should see the most dangerous man in America. If you have. Hello, um, my name is Greg Perio, and First of all, thank you. It was a very stimulating discussion, presentation and discussion. Um, I want to look at democracy for a second, very briefly, and suggest that there's something more fundamental than democracy, and that's justice. That it, that's a much more human-centered feeling and sensitivity. And dare I say social justice is important. And so in agenda setting for journalism, I think that that has to be really high up there, is how are we looking at justice? Is justice being dealt? And so that means that we have to then go to the human level, to the, the end of the, at all kinds of levels to see how people are feeling. And that creates the empathy that you can have in journalism. And and I think this is important because, also because we have to recreate community. Uh, community, um, I can remember Hillary Clinton talking about the Arab community and the Latino community and the African American community, the LGBT uh, community, et cetera. And I, and I would sit there and I'd look at my own family that's full of different colors and nationalities and, um, uh, and, and sexual preferences. And I'd say, no, we're one community, you know? Um, so I think that's part of the challenge is the, a lot of these divisions have come historically, but a lot of them have come about because of manipulation by political actors. So I think we need to really look at justice and justice takes us down to the human level. Well, uh, with that, we'll break for uh, 15. Oh, I'm sorry, please. Um, hi, I'm Jenny Holm. I'm here from Internews. We're a nonprofit organization working with independent media around the world. And actually, my, my question dovetails well with that one. Um, the public journalism or civic journalism projects, I'm, some of them that I'm most interested in right now are things that bring people who have differing views on an issue um, together to talk directly about that issue. And I going head to head is the wrong terminology, but projects like Spaceship Media, um, The Many, where they're bringing together conservative and liberal women, or um, StoryCorps is one small step that are bringing to people together to talk just about their, their past and their histories, even though they're on different sides of the political divide. But my 
question with a lot of these projects are, do journalists, as they're trained today, really have the skills to be moderating or mediating these kinds of conversations? Because it's very different. That's a very different conversation to moderate than, say, a political debate where the two candidates are really, they're not speaking to each other or for each other. They're speaking to their own constituencies. So um, is there, should we be training journalists differently to moderate those kind of conversations? Or does this need to be moderated by a different group of people entirely and then amplified by the media? Well, I, I think I, I'm not in the business anymore, but there is a new emphasis on, on facilitative skills and, and uh, you know, collaborative approaches. So you're, you're absolutely right about that. It's not, it, it's, <clears throat> was always embedded in the practice, but there's a greater consciousness of it in the context of journalism, establishing ways that we're not. Could I comment on that? This would be a great opportunity for journalism and the expertise that exists in the deliberative democracy field to collaborate. You don't, there are literally thousands of people in this country who have exactly the kind of skills for listening to create understanding and connection as opposed to the pros and cons on an issue. And I, it's wonderful the number of projects that are bumping, uh, jumping up now in terms of all over the country from different places, but specifically in journalism. But we could go much quicker to scale if it was done in a collaboration across the fields that hold the deep ex expertise. We need journalists to keep the journalistic perspective more than we need them to learn new skills. I, if they're going to do them, they need to new skills, but there's another way to get there. I would just make a, a small practical point with that, too, is that sometimes we talk about pre-work in conflict resolution, which I, I like to rail against that because often so much of the work is done in the pre-work. And it makes sense then if you shine a media spotlight that the that you know the the communicative moment, rich with people upset who don't know each other, and all of that is quite juicy, right? But so much of the work gets done before people ever come into the room. And if you're working with communities who are uh, marginalized historically, and where the larger na narratives we tell about them, um, about those communities, you know, frame them in terms of deviance and uh, you know, and, and a variety of other negative associations, then there's important work to do in advance. I, I think that would be an area where the de deliberative democracy work and then other forms of conflict resolution work, community building, and even and people who have deep relationships can think about what's this work that needs to be done in advance. And, and, and then, of course, there's an interesting question about it, does that become part of the story and how do we track that and how do we do so in a way that kind of retains that complexity? Um, sometimes in conflict resolution stories, we like to tell, I, we have kind of a couple different types of stories. One where we tell about how this amazing conflict was, how people were able to shift it and it was quite, it was amazing and how they found common ground and collaboration, et cetera. Or these other ones where we find that the thing fell apart and the people didn't listen enough to local people and it was pr pretty colonial, et cetera. And, and not enough stories about, uh, which are the most interesting, about how people were able to journey together over time, what the obstacles were, how they worked through it, and all of that. So I think we need to throw pre-work out the, out the window. But I, I do think in terms of in that junction with the media, uh, just kind of widening our view outside of that moment where, where people sit down, and you have a facilitator, and the thing starts. You know, I think it, it, it's so much of the other work is, is where um, the transformative action takes place. I'll just say one quick thing about in terms of training, not as if there's one lens that you put on to train journalists, but I had a dear friend Skype into my global communication class a few weeks ago, who's a news anchor in Paris, and I asked her, she has a master's from Columbia, um, undergraduate degree from Wellesley, and I asked her, you know, what was the most important class, that, journalism class that you took, or the most important class that you took to prepare yourself for work as a foreign correspondent? And she said it was comparative religion. And I, so I think, and, you know, you can see my students. So I think, you know, we have work to do in training journalists to do the work. But there's, you know, lots of work that can be done in terms of training journalists just to understand the world that they're going to end up covering. And I think that that's always, th that really stuck with me and um, I think is an important, um, an important point. Okay, we'll break for 15. <laughs>